Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Melinda Krennick, and I will be presenting with my colleague, Shauna Crossan. Our slides are available at z.umn.edu slash storymaps underscore NASIS. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, story maps offer a way to integrate uh, interactive digital maps with text, images, and other media to make compelling arguments. They are a low barrier, low anxiety way to get people started mapping and presenting visual explanations. With increasing awareness of available tools, we have seen rising interest from instructors in using story maps as assignments. To contextualize what we mean by rising interest, at the University of Minnesota, we have over 13,000 user accounts in our ArcGIS online organization, um, which is a platform that we use for story maps and other mapping activities. In the past year, those users have created or modified over 2,600 story maps. Um, so the, the Story Maps curriculum team came into being in 2018 in response to these trends. Our goal was to pool expertise, design resources, and help instructors figure out how to best harness the possibilities of Story Maps for their course content. Over the past two years, our team has seen a steady increase in classes asking for help with story maps um, from just a handful of classes in the fall of 2018 to about 17 classes, I think, um, and around 500 students this semester. Even with the disruption of the pandemic, which took out a bunch of classes we were scheduled to help with in the spring, there's still been a lot of interest. Um, and these story maps are being used for assignments in a wide variety of departments from fisheries to art history. Um, and uh, for us, many of our faculty that we're working with are um, from disciplines in which map making and spatial thinking aren't usually emphasized. So for the rest of the presentation, we are going to tell you about a few success stories from these classes, as well as some advice about um, how to design and carry out a story map assignment. Our first example is History 3020. This is a required class for history majors, which introduces how to do history. So how to design and implement a research project, engage with primary sources, and pull together diverse archival material to make a point. Um, there are multiple sections of this course offered each semester, focusing on different historical eras and geographic regions. And we've helped with assignments in five or six different iterations now. What makes these classes unique is that they encourage students to really dig into the complexities of making maps based on historical sources. Students are given a lot of autonomy about how they want to frame their projects um, and have to think through what is even possible to map or to do with the sources that are available. So we try to help them by getting them started georeferencing historical maps, um, maybe locating some sources with good spatial information, but they really are the ones deciding how to arrange and make meaning from the different texts, images, and maps. Um, and we've had a lot of positive feedback from students saying that it made them feel more invested in the stakes of mapping and more aware and, and critical of maps when they appeared in textbooks and secondary texts. Um, and I'm going to switch over to my colleague, Shauna, to give some more examples. Great. Thank you, Melinda. Um, we've had so many courses, history courses working with us. And it, again, we expect history to be a place where we're going to find spatial information, but the depth and the amount and the type of practices we've seen happening in history has really been um, rewarding and um, interesting and rewarding. So Melinda was talking about the History 3020 where students were really digging into primary sources, making spreadsheets, uploading those spreadsheets into ArcGIS Online, finding addresses, finding context, and using maps as data and really putting that data together. This example for History 3020 727, which is the history of the Holocaust, is going in a slightly different direction. Um, this project is currently um, happening, so I didn't, I don't have an example or a slide from it, but uh, the project is based loosely on this story map um, that was published. Uh, it's on the uh, Esri's story map gallery, the classic story maps. Um, Placing oral histories, a visualization of four Syrian refugees' narratives of displacement. 
So this, this project has students mapping in a slightly different way. It's based on journeys. This map, story map has journeys of refugees as they left Syria. Um, and the project that the students will be doing, each student will be assigned one individual and will map that individual's life through um, from when they were born, through the war, through World War II and post-World War II. Um, the primary sources for this project are um, oral histories that are um, from the US Holocaust Museum. Each student will be assigned one individual and we'll use that oral history as well as other archival material in order to place that individual's life through time, um, where they lived and what happened. Um, then at the end, we will do a larger class project where we will take all of these individuals and place them on a map. So again, we get both the individual piece as well as a larger picture of what's going on. The maps really are providing a framework around which all of the rest of the, the lives of these individuals will be placed. So we're really excited to see how using that map as a framework allows students to dig deeper into these stories. Um, the story is leading them to make a map, but the map is also leading them to tell a bigger story about the, the, these individuals. When I introduced this project to the students last week, um, I walked them through this Placing Oral Histories story map. Many of them commented on the visual, the, the impact that the visuals had and that the interactive map really brought home to them the distance that these refugees had to travel and how that disrupted their lives. Um, we're expecting that in this project, when students have to build maps of these Holocaust survivors, that that will have a similar impact on them of um, examining the primary sources and creating a story in their lives. Um, the next example I'm going to talk about is a really different one. This is from a second semester Spanish course. Um, we did this a year and a half ago. We're planning to do it last spring, but the pandemic disrupted our plans. So this is built in an older story map template. Um, the point of this project. Um, again, was using the map as a framework. Um, we weren't really expecting to use spatial thinking or to find this, well, I was, but a lot of people were a little, didn't think that languages were a place that we were going to be using spatial thinking. However, all languages are spoken in a place, aren't they? And so, and language courses focus on cultural understanding and cultural learning. So it took a little convincing, but once we got um, a couple people on board, the languages are really running with this. We have several projects going right now with languages, but I'm gonna start on this one. The project was a, second, a semester final project and it allows students to really demonstrate learning in many ways. They had to select a topic of their choice and they did research on this topic. They could do it alone or in pairs. Topics were anything from this was coffee, we had some do tequila, we had some do tacos, we had some do soccer, so there were, a lot of different topics selected. The only requirement was that their topic had to have some spatial component based in some region of a Spanish speaking country or area. Um, each student was required to choose three points and they had an image for each point and they had to write 75 words in Spanish. We used the Esri classic story map tour template. Um, students wrote all of their scripts, found images and built the story map and then they had to present it out loud to the class and have questions back and forth. Um, the entire thing was done in Spanish. We had some really unexpected results, um, really pleased with the results that came out. This instructor has been teaching for 20 years and she said this was the most impactful final project she's done with this class. So we're really excited to do it again this um, in the spring. She said that having the map as a framework and as a presentation tool works so much better than just a PowerPoint. The map and the spatial element gave focus to the project and embedded the cultural learning. Um, I do have a quote down here, just that the students really found that mapping as a, as a, a way for them to learn more and dig deep. Um, they were really interested in the patterns and looking at the differences in regions or comparisons in regions. Um, <clears throat> the story map gave the students the visual cues, which was especially appropriate for students at this level of language acquisition. Um, the instructor observed that having the map as a framework um, building the map, the students building the map, allowed them or encouraged them to ask different types of questions than they had asked before. And they discovered patterns and relationships that they had, she hadn't noticed students noticing before, if that makes sense. She felt that students had a much deeper understanding of their topic and of their project than she's seen in other classes. So we were really excited about this. We did structure this assignment so that the, all the writing and the locating of images was done before they even touched the story map tool. Um, the focus of the project was really on the language, not on learning GIS. 
but the spatial component really did and having them build the map really did bring this home and made it a really powerful, impactful project. Uh, <clears throat> um, we had learned, we could tell a whole lot of other examples, but I'm just gonna kind of go over some of the things that we've learned uh, over the last couple of years doing these projects. Spatial thinking in terms of the pedagogical impact, of course, is the primary thing that we're going for. Um, we lo I love this quote, a student said, uh, they got caught up in and excited about making maps. That certainly made us happy. Um, the spatial thinking has come up in a lot of different subjects, like I said. Really the power of having the students make the map is, we, I don't think we went into this project thinking that that was gonna be as impactful, but it, um, it, it's a very big difference, as all of you know, than having them look at a map that somebody else made. It makes, means that they then question other maps that they see. They know that maps are built by somebody. What's included in the map is important, but what's not included in the map is important. All of these things are, are this type of thinking is what is, are things we've been noticing. Faculty have also noticed the impact on student learning by having students make the map. We've had several faculty repeat these projects and so we're really excited to see where those go. One example is we had a group of students create maps about the routes of materials and people involved in silver mining in South America in the 1700s. The map was based on secondary sources, um, but as students built the map, they realized that what was in the secondary source didn't make sense. And they said they never would have noticed that had they not tried to map what this source said. So we love that that spatial thinking is causing them to question other, um, other place things that they're doing. Anna, um, we know the map, okay, got it. The map design might not always be perfect, but what they learn about creating a map, communicating with maps and interpreting spatial data is really what we want them to come out with. Um, I know uh, Dr. Santee talked about writing in the previous session. I wish I had been able to see that video because I'm very interested in that. We know that writing has become um, an unexpected big part of this. We have writing as the visual writing, writing, communicating with the visuals of a map has been a big part of this. Um, we've been partnering with the Writing Center at the university to include story maps in projects and to work with them to create assignments. Um, they communicate visually with maps that's part of it, but also writing the different levels of text that are involved in story maps has been another part. Um, grading has been a problem. Um, faculty were really concerned with their ability to grade maps. So we created rubrics. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, we also feel that scaffolding the story map is really important. Spatial, working with spatial data is a new thing for most students. It's also something instructors and faculty are not comfortable with. So in, in this case, at least, so we've been providing quite a bit of support there. Um, <clears throat> but we've also learned from students that while these projects usually involve significantly more work than just writing a paper, they also, students feel they learn more and they found a lot of value in the creative process. I do want to share quick before I'm out of time, we do have a resource if you're interested at storymaps.umn.edu. Um, that is a website that we built uh, in the hopes that faculty could do these projects without support. Uh, we found that they work better with some support, but these are great. We put all these resources are here. You're free to take a look at this. It includes rubrics, sample student work, um, sample assignments, examples. I will uh, just a caveat on here that we are currently updating this site to reflect um, the Esri Story Maps new builder as opposed to many of these resources are written with the um, classic Story Maps in mind. So just note that that's changing. So please take a look at that. Um, and we will welcome any questions in the Slack. Thank you.